Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Dana Lim, cosmetic physician and first vice president of the Australasian Medical Services Coalition, also affectionately known as MSEC. In a special collaboration with Dr. Jake Sloan and David Siegel from Inside Aesthetics, we're doing a bumper issue TED Talk for MSEC in May regarding personal branding, content creation, and in particular, podcasting. Um, MSEC is a nonprofit organization representing all health professionals, including doctors, nurses, allied health, researchers, and more. We have regular CPD webinars covering all specialties, including cosmetic medicine. And we also advocate for minority and disadvantaged groups. In fact, we have a fundraising event in June for the Sydney Children's Hospital in raising awareness for autism, so stay tuned. For the uninitiated, Inside Aesthetics is a cosmetic and wellness podcast running every Friday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other um, major podcasting apps. Jake and David host expert guest speakers to discuss their specialty in the aesthetics and wellness space. And it has evolved from a pure aesthetic um, topic to wellness issues like sleep, functional health, and meditation. They've run over 100 episodes in just a space of over two years, um, educating the audience with insider knowledge and leaving no stone unturned, whether it be on injectables, surgery, devices, nutrition, or business. Rather than being the guest speaker today, I'm now interviewing Jake and David, putting them on the spot regarding the lowdowns and behind the scenes action for podcasting. Without further ado, let's take it away. So let's start with Jake. Can you give me a bit more of your background? So thank you, Dana. I feel very weird being interviewed in an M studio, but <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, so I'm a cosmetic physician specializing in facial aesthetics um, from the UK. I've been in Australia about six years now. Um, my background was in general surgery, so trained in the UK for about seven, eight years, and then did another few years here in Australia. And then finally woke up and saw the lights and realized aesthetic medicine is for me. So yeah, so I've been um, injecting in Sydney. I met David um, through some of his clinics. Um, I work for, well, I consult for Allegan, so I'm a trainer with Allegan. Um, I do some work with Face Coach with Greg Goodman, um, training for them, and I've got a sort of a new association with Skin SkinCeuticals. Excellent. And how about you, David? So I've been in the industry for close to 15 years. So I kind of got into the industry by accident and never left. So it's one of those things you, you don't really plan for. So I started off in the industry um, importing lasers from overseas and selling them to doctors and physicians in Australia. Um, along the way, um, I met a doctor who's quite well known now in the industry, Dr. Joseph Ajaka um, from Cosmos Clinic. And um, we became good friends and started that business together oh, back in 2006, round about then. Um, so I was with him, helping set up that practice. Um, during that time, I wrote and published a book through Fairfax Media called Skin, which was the layperson's guide to understanding basic cosmetic procedures or the procedures around during that time. Um, I then got involved in a business called Laser Clinics Australia. Um, I own um, a number of their franchises that have been involved in that business for nearly 12 years. Um, worked in the um, surgical space for a short period of time and then met Jake, as you said, um, a few years ago in one of my clinics, we became good friends and Jake came to me one day and said, hey, we should do a podcast or I want to do a podcast. Would you like to do it with me? Um, and two years later, almost here we are. Well, I initially invited you as my first yes. guest um, because I thought, oh, you know, this will be a, a nice sort of synergy of business and, and cosmetic medicine. It'll be a good episode. And then I thought, hold on a minute. Why don't you just come on every podcast um, and help me out? So, so here we are, 119 yeah. episodes later. Yes. Oh, I also do bonsai as well. So completely unrelated to this. Yes, and you just uh, had to tack that on, didn't you? Yeah. Well, it's interesting because cosmetic medicine are all about making people to look younger. But with trees, I'm trying to make them look older. So it's quite interesting that juxtaposition between. I thought about it that way. Yes. So now inside aesthetics is a huge undertaking and time commitment. What is your end objective? Well, um, well, at the start, it, it truly, well, it still is a passion project. So we, we never went into this thinking uh, that it could be uh, leveraged in any financial way. I mean, that would be a great bonus when we first started, but yeah, we really didn't think that would be the case. Um, we, well, I sort of conceived the podcast just because I thought, well, there's a lot of patients coming in with, with questions. There's a lot of injectors out there confused. There's a lot of confusion generally. Um, so I just wanted to get some good information out there. 
Um, but yeah, it's morphed, like you said, we, we've branched into anything to do with looking good, feeling good. So, you know, David's um, got some uh, contacts in those, those sort of circles. So we've had functional doctors on, sleep experts. Um, uh, we've had a, a CBD doctor. Um, we're looking into some interesting sort of podcasts for the future on that sort of realm. So, yeah. So, um, but I mean, you probably talk about the finances. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I come from more of a, of a business background. So I guess, you know, I think Jake initially when he asked me to come on was more to talk about the business side of things. And then I guess I've been involved in the industry for a period of time and always looked at it from a business slash lay person's perspective rather than a medical perspective. So I guess that was the synergy between us was coming from different perspectives, different backgrounds. Um, and I think, as you said, it initially started as aesthetics, but then it sort of dawned on us talking to all these different people. God, I'm sweating. Oh, my ears are sweating. I'm nervous. I'm nervous <laughs> being interviewed on a podcast. Normally we're asking the questions. Um, it sort of morphed into, into other topics. And that's what we sort of realized. But all these things sort of fit together. You know, if you look good and you feel good, you know, that's the ultimate goal. And quite often we focus on one thing and not the other. And whether you're looking at, you know, integrative health or, you know, I want to do a, a topic on, you know, psychedelics and how that's being used to treat people with psychiatric illnesses and PTSD and so on. So just trying to explore everything, grow our listeners. Um, I guess one of our goals as well is to try and unite the industry and bring all the different areas together um, and try and create some more cohesive so cohesiveness um, and just educate people. Yeah, and I, I guess with COVID that, well, we had to pivot the, how we you know, recorded, how we met in person, how we did everything. And one of the kind of weird things to come out of it was we realized that, you know, the, the providers and, and the people making devices also lost those opportunities to meet people. So we reached out to a couple of, um, you know, uh, brands like BTL Aesthetics and SkinCeuticals and we said, look, we want to get good information out there. You want to speak to, you know, people who own clinics, doctors, nurses, etc." why don't we do something in partnership? So yeah, we've done a couple of um, sponsorships um, with you know a couple of reputable brands. Yes, um, they helped us to sort of purchase this fancy bit of equipment <laughs> with the investment that we got, but you know, it's been really synergistic. The companies have fed back how great it's been for them, how they've managed to tap into you know, unusual markets or people that they never would get access to you know, at a conference where they might have a few minutes sort of stolen over a coffee. So it's been really good. Yeah. I think it's people trust podcasts now. I think that people in general have become quite disillusioned with um, mainstream media to a certain extent and feeling like everyone's trying to sell them something all the time. So I think the podcast provides a platform where you can't sort of fake who you are for an hour. Do you know what I mean? Like it, you, it gives people the ability to have a conversation that's unedited, it's uncurated. You can hear things in context. There's no grabs with someone trying to catch you out in a sentence or something that's taken completely you know, as I said, out of context. So it, it just, I think podcasts, and that's why they're becoming so popular, they just give people a way to capture, to listen to content and absorb it in their own time. They might be in the car, they might be going to the gym, going for a walk. So it just allows people to have um, communication fed to them in a more, I guess, uh, not sincere, but a more genuine way in, 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 and in the comfort of, I guess, their car or their home, um, rather than sitting in front of the TV or being talked at, as you said, during a conference. Mm. So where do you see video content like the ones on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube and other social platform media, uh, so social media platforms, sorry? Well, we've been particularly bad at that. And, and funnily enough, we were just trying to set up some cameras just today for you, Dana. And it's um, it's a skill in itself. And, you know, we, we feel like we've mastered the audio. We're really happy with um, the actual, you know, the, the, the sound quality, which is important for a podcast. Um, if you listen to some sort of um, you know more basically recorded podcasts, they're actually quite difficult to listen to, especially when you're going to talk for an hour. Sometimes an hour and a half we go on for, so it has to be quite rich and and um, you know nice to listen to. We started recording through a phone, like literally my iPhone next to me from from episode one, and we we captured like I don't know fifty, maybe even more episodes all on my phone and just the practicalities and the logistics of actually getting that data off the phone is actually. It's actually impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, these things are like 11 gigabytes big and, and, and you know, around that sort of size. So just transporting and, and downloading those to Dropbox or otherwise, it just became impossible. Yeah. And because it's from a phone, you know, it wasn't the best quality, but it was a good start for us. Yeah. And I, we want to do it properly. I mean, I think, you, you know, you can do it with a phone or you can do it with a cheap piece of equipment. But I think we've put so much effort into getting the audio right that we want to get the video right. And that costs money. 
So we're at that sort of weird crossroads where, you know, we are in a certain, in, in some way starting to make this like a venture that we can, you know, I guess put more investment into, but it's a chicken or the egg yeah. kind of scenario. I mean, we, we've toyed with having a sort of a mirrored YouTube channel for, well, since we started, we actually announced it and then we've had to retract it because we still haven't found anyone to, to help us with that. But um, it will be something we do, um, you know, from a business perspective, I know your doctor's listening you know, would be interested in how to leverage that. Well, we know that Instagram algorithms are certainly sort of driving more content that's video based rather than photos. TikTok, um, Snapchat, that's why they went mad because they, you know, they're, they're interesting, they're fun. Yes, they're little snippets, but if you're going to do something educational, I think this platform would sit perfectly with YouTube. No, the thing is, you're saying um, if you capture both video and audio, and people are focusing on the video instead. You don't have to have as good a sound quality. Is that what you're saying? No, so we'd still have, I mean, let's say we were literally going to mirror, we would still record exactly like this, but also with cameras. So what you see would sound like this as well. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're potentially gonna do, we haven't actually announced this, but um, you know, why not? We're gonna look into doing something slightly different that sits alongside our sort of standard Friday podcast. Mm -hmm. So we may call it something like the Masterclass series or something else where we'll actually, you know, do something quite different that has to be visual form because it's, you know, you want to be seeing this thing, whatever the Masterclass is. Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of the quality, I think if you're watching like a 30 second video on your phone, people are quite happy to forgive crap audio and it's sort of like a little bit of fun, but when you're, Imagine watching a movie, like a great movie, but it sounds like, you know, someone's talking, the audio looks like, sounds like it was recorded in a bathroom. People aren't going to enjoy that experience. So if you're asking people to give you their attention for an hour, hour and a half, it has to be good quality. Okay. Fair enough. Um, for me personally, I can certainly see the attraction of podcasts. I mean, I'm really much happier on this side of the camera. And, <laughs> so um, I, I did do my hair and makeup just for the record, but I prefer if you guys are in the limelight. <laughs> So apart from actually getting David on for the first episode, what other difficulties did you encounter in the beginning? Well, actually, well, David wasn't our first guest because we joined forces by then. We actually had um, Fiona Tuck. Is that first was. one? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, we, we, we literally made it up as we went along, to be completely honest. So yes, we did our research on, on how to record. We weren't using this, we were using um, some we were using it was uh, I think it was called a forky side. It was like six different pieces of equipment that plugged in together, and there was cables, and it was just a nightmare. I mean, there was so many places where things could get screwed up. Yeah. Whereas this is an all-in-one unit, so mm. yeah. And everything went into a laptop. We were using GarageBand that then got sent to a sound editor, and you know, there's still some clunkiness. When I say clunkiness, I mean, <clears throat> I will sit down after this listen to everything that we've said i'll crop out any you know anything that's you know not necessary so it sounds a bit more seamless and that has to be done there's no other automated way of doing that i think um you know i think it shows that you know if, if you have a, a completely unedited episode it, it just doesn't flow yeah and sometimes again it's a little bit difficult to listen to so i think um putting a bit of investment in that works but um yeah we've made it up as we've gone along to be completely honest and there's um uh, there's hosting sites they're called so we use one called libsyn so you create an account um all of the edited podcasts then get uploaded to libsyn every week then i sit down and write everything that will then be replicated onto apple podcasts so what you read on apple podcasts is me having obviously typed on my laptop and then that sort of gets distributed by magic to all of the podcast apps so spotify soundcloud you name it there's like maybe a hundred of them so from that perspective once you've kind of done it once and you know the systems yeah. it works but behind the scenes normally on a thursday night there's a bit of a mad panic where yeah. i'm up at sort of midnight well i think i'm <laughs> trying I've to finish offered, it off. i've offered to take that role so that's going to be me now yeah good luck. um yeah <laughs> and then it's like you know trying to find interesting people to talk to cover discussions and and uh, topics you haven't covered before or a different angle researching the person um, coming up with questions or you know discussion pieces but in the beginning, it's kind of hard, right? Because you're asking people to give up a few hours of their time to come and talk to you for a product that doesn't exist or doesn't mm -hmm. have any track record. And everyone wants something for their time, right? So that was difficult in the beginning, trying to convince people. So, I mean, luckily, you know, Jake and I know people in the industry. So we're able to call in a few favors, just say, hey, we're starting this podcast, you know, come and chat to us for a few hours. It may go somewhere, it may not. And I think that's the advantage of, I guess, having maturity in the industry and knowing people that you could sort of convince them to come and do you a favor but that's initially that getting started and 
creating a product yeah. that has a track record is I think the most difficult bit. I think the main difficulty we have now, you know, the technical side is pretty much done, you know, we know what we're doing, but it's maintaining the pace. And um, like you said, um, everything's got to be done at least a month ahead. So, you know, if I'm away for a week, I'm sick or, you know, David's doing something, we need stuff up our sleeve to, to put out regardless. I don't, in fact, we haven't had a single week where we haven't put something no. out and some weeks we've put out two. I think one week we did three when it was COVID. Mm. So that's the biggest challenge. And so we're writing scripts, we're reaching out, we've got a thousand WhatsApp groups going on with people all over the world. Um, and so we actually hired our first staff member maybe three or four months ago. She's yeah. our um, producer, Bridget. So. She's doing an amazing job just to sort of keep an eye on things. She's sort of yeah. the orchestrator. Yeah. They've been doing things like you wouldn't think of, like doing a sound check, especially with Zoom. Like here, we can control the environment, right? You come in, you sit down. We know how everything works. We know how your microphone's set up. But when you're doing Zoom, right, you could be talking to someone in Prague, for example, and you don't know what their Wi-Fi connection's like, whether they've got a good mic, are they recording in their bathroom where you've got lots of echo or where there's people... So, I mean, we had someone the other day that, um, you know, there's music going on in the, in the background <laughs> of their house and it's like, that's all coming through the microphone. So we had to start doing sound checks for Zoom so we can actually make sure your mic's working, you sound good, is the room you're in appropriate, you know, letting them know. Just stuff that's common sense to us now, but it's not common sense to people that haven't done this before because podcast is still a bit of an emerging platform. Yeah, we've actually produced um, an article in... Yeah. Um, aesthetic practitioner where we said how to zoom like a pro because something that we've learned badly at the start yeah. and and i think we've got much better so it, it's it's a skill that i think you know whether you're a doctor or a businessman you're going to need to learn how to do this properly because we're not moving away from zoom or or virtual conferencing no and it's been good too because even now well in the future obviously people will be able to travel again but just being able to reach out to people internationally because australia is a pretty small community compared to the rest of the world so it's allowed us to tap into a lot of overseas guests and capture audiences over there, which has been great. Yeah. So through the COVID lockdown period, was it actually easier or harder for you guys to get speakers on board? And, and what was the pace like then? It was easier, wasn't it? It was easier. And, you know, I'm sure you noticed on Instagram, there's this sort of tidal wave of love and, <laughs> and everyone's doing Instagram lives and, and webinars were coming out of people's asses. And yeah. it was almost too much. There's too much content and, and so sort of, jostling to try and get people's attention with the podcast when so many other things going on was difficult in a way but also made it easier for people to say yes I'll come on because yeah. I'm doing nothing I'm sitting around for three months so yeah sure I'll come on the podcast yeah. well we got we got to talk to guests that would probably ordinarily have never had time for us so we had like Christian Subio on from the United States we had Dr Paul Nassif from the show Botched so there was a lot of high profile guests with big profile with um big Instagram accounts and big followings that were great in terms of getting them on and having those discussions with them that they would have never had time to do before. Yeah, and, and it forced us to pivot to Zoom because, um, well, there was a period of time where I was sick, so I couldn't even come here. <clears throat> um, then eventually, you know, I wasn't sick, but we still had to reach out to people. So we, we were forced to use Zoom and it's certainly expanded our horizons because now we're talking to far more interesting guests than just people that we can source locally. Oh, it sounds amazing and congratulations on the first staff member. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now it's all about targeted marketing. So who is your actual audience? Well, I mean, I don't think we actually started with um, trying to capture a certain audience, but just by the nature of the podcast and the topics that we talk about, um, from looking at our Instagram account and the people that comment and leave reviews for us, it seems like most of them are uh, people within the aesthetics industry. So tons and tons of nurses, cosmetic physicians, plastic surgeons, derms, yeah. um, lots of beauty therapists, people in uh, sort of, I guess, allied health. So, you know, your physios, um, massage. Clinic owners, clinic, yeah. uh, companies making devices, anyone really, because I think the topics are so diverse that, you know, that they may not resonate with everyone every single time, but, you know, we sort of There's something shift, for shift the momentum each time. Um, I think the one that we, well, the, the main group that we haven't really focused on is actually the consumer, um, partly because we're talking about sort of industry inside knowledge in a way, but actually, you know, I've got lots of patients who have dipped in and they're like, yeah, I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, we sort of joke, but David does sort of bring the, the lay person perspective to it because he's not, he's not uh, an injector or a doctor. So, you know, I remember particularly at the start of the podcast, when we first started, we made a real point of sort of David asking 
lay perspective questions we sort of we don't have to do that deliberately now we just do it but um yeah i think it i think anyone can learn from it really yeah as jack said i think it depends on the topic i mean we've had someone on that wants to hear that talks about facelifts and there might be people listening that go oh, I've thought about that procedure or my mum or my dad are thinking about it and i'd like to know more about it so as you said i think it depends on the topic and the guest people will dip in and out depending on if that topic interests them so do you actually modify the podcast based on the feedback you get and do you collect questions from the audience so what we have noticed is that podcasts are consumed very easily you know you just download it for free listen in your car you don't have to interact with us uh, and we you know unless we had a way of capturing the statistics which we sort of do it's not perfect but spotify will give us some some relatively good information and lips in the the hosting um site that i mentioned that gives us some good um data so we can sort of merge the two and roughly work out who's listening where they are in the world we can see what city there are but that's about it and then through our instagram statistics we can see you know our breakdown of female to male followers age as well so we sort of blended that all together and have a sort of an understanding of who's listening but yeah. it's actually very hard yeah. and you know when we reach out to people to say you know what would you like to listen to or or, or send you your questions it doesn't always work i mean some people were desperate to ask a question uh, some guests are way more popular but generally speaking i think we hit the mark with our questioning and people mm -hmm. have grown to trust that we're going to do it right and so yeah it's sort of it's a bit of a paradox you would think that people want to ask questions but they don't yeah people are voyeurs they like to watch and listen Yes, yeah, true. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are busy. I mean, I think that um, there's a danger in trying to be everything to everyone. And if you, I mean, feedback's great, um, but I think if you're trying to make everyone happy, then inevitably you're probably not happy with the product yourself. I think it's important for us to enjoy the conversations, mm. um, and then your audience will find you. I think. Yeah. I mean, we haven't actually tried the functionality, but on this new piece of kit that we've got, we can actually have people call in and and ask a question live yeah or jake can tell us a story <laughs> dana can't hear anything <laughs> he's just doing his uh, sound effects yeah there's, there's it's like story time of a fairy tale intro you'll hear it when you listen back but yeah i'm sure your audience will appreciate it but um but you know but timing that's going to be difficult and you know do we advertise the time that you can call i haven't quite worked out how that yeah. would work but we did an instagram live just the other day with them um, julie horn just to um, announce our competition winner and you know having that more spontaneous interaction with with your potential listeners and, and fans was really nice um so we'll try and add a little bit more of that as we go into the future but you know it may not be part of the actual podcast but so people can interact a bit better with us yeah jake has been encouraging me to be more uh social media savvy I'm, yes. I, I'm generally an anti social media guy so it's been it's been like me trying to like force myself to be more out there so i'm I'm making an effort. The people want to know, David. They want to know you. No, they don't. <laughs> well, I think they do. It's about establishing your own brand. And I can see that you put a lot of effort into it. So how much work actually goes into one episode in terms of man hours? We haven't actually calculated. I, I reckon a good five to six hours per episode. So I'll walk you through the process. So you know, come up with an idea. So for example, Dr. Steve Harris, we're going to record with him on Saturday, he's a UK cosmetic physician. So we reach out through WhatsApp or, or Instagram generally, uh, have a bit of a conversation, then set up a group chat, thrash out some ideas about what we're going to talk about. Um, then David and I will sort of together through Dropbox produce a script, which is basically just a list of questions and topics. We share that with our guests. There's a bit of bouncing around of ideas. Um, then obviously we schedule the date, the actual recording probably takes an hour and a half to two hours, depending on yeah. and what we're talking about. Well, we need to get here earlier, set up, making sure everything works. They come in, you know, meet and greet, get comfortable and then get going. And then as you said, like it's 60 to 90 minutes of discussion. Yeah. And then immediately after that, David will throw that up onto Dropbox. So then I can listen to it the next day. Yeah. I'll literally listen to the whole thing again. So that's another hour to two hours, depending on how long the podcast was. And literally in Dropbox, I don't know if you've ever opened a file, you can write comments in the file. So I'll be right. Okay. At minute oh three, stop here, chop that sentence. You know, I'm writing comments for our editor. Who's um, amazing. His name's Andy Mayer down in Melbourne. Uh, then email him, he'll email back a few days later. I'll listen to it again to proof listen to it. Uh, sometimes I listen to it on sort of double speed or one and a half speed just to speed it up. 
and then it finally goes out but but i still haven't uploaded it to libsyn and written the whole scroll for apple Podcasts. there's a lot of work um i guess i've just kind of got used to it now um yeah we've got our own responsibilities david does other stuff in the background and you know david, david does you know a lot of this sort of stuff that i'm not interested in like invoicing and placing <laughs> people and <laughs> all the other stuff yeah it's um it's a labor of love and then there's the social media and, and all the rest of it. So actually today, I mean, I won't mention the name, but I think we found a writer to help us yeah. with a little bit of content, but yeah. uh, we'll see how we go. It's a full-time job. Well, it could be. Yeah. Maybe one day. It is. And it's really hard to find someone to write the narrative the way you want it to represent your brand. That's, that's the main thing. That's why, I mean, David sort of jokes at me, but I'm so OCD with stuff like that, <laughs> that we've actually paid people in the past and I've just, I've blocked it or, or edited it. I just, yeah, I just couldn't stand someone not speaking in our tonality. Yeah. So, because it's your brand, it, it's not just a post. It, if, if someone's speaking like an excitable, you know, teenager and that's not you, then you're pushing sort of a different message. So, yeah. And your audience, like, what the hell? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there were a few that we had to delete, weren't there? Yeah. <laughs> You know, seeing that MSEC is targeting um, all health professionals, we're still quite doctor heavy, and I'd really like to hear both your doctor and layperson perspective, so to speak. How do you feel doctors fare in general with um, personal branding and business management? Mm, well, I think you can say that first because I think you got, well, wow, sure. okay. You got better insight. Um, look, I think that I'll put it this way if I had studied um, business my whole life and gone to university and, you know, got five to 10 years of experience. And then I decided, hey, I'm going to do medicine. Um, you'd probably go, what? what? What are you doing? And I think that people sort of underestimate what's involved with business. So I think that there's probably an element of, um, I'm going to use, trying to say this in a way that's not going to come across as offensive, because I don't mean it as offensive, but I think there's an element of um, Naivety, naivety or un unconsciously incompetent to a certain extent because they don't know what they don't know. And I think because doctors generally were the smartest people at school, they were the smartest people at university. And I think going through the medical system is quite hard from everything I've heard from, you know, various doctors that I've met over the years. It's quite a, quite a journey. It's like a baptism by fire. Like it's mm. pretty full on. And then you come out and you've got to go, okay, well, I've been all this time studying and now I'm going to do a business bit. There's none, of, there's none of those skills there. So I think that part of the problem is that um, they don't know what they don't know in terms of like, you know, um, just basic business principles, people skills to a certain extent. Um, yeah, I think that the best businesses that I've seen is when doctors and business people work together because then you get the best of both worlds. And it's actually why, you know, it's a good reason why I invited David to the podcast because I don't have that skill set. And if there's anything that I've learned through through my years of both being a doctor and injecting, it's you surround yourself with people who who do things better than you. Yeah. So, for example, Bridget, our producer, she does all that stuff that we just can't or, or, or you know, she does better than us. Yeah. Oh, well, um, here's an example. And we can edit this out if you don't want us to talk about it, but your tax situation. Oh, so, yeah, when I met Jake, we're talking, you know, we're talking finance and business. We come from like both similar like backgrounds. We're both Jewish, same age, all that sort of stuff. So we sort of, our parents remind us of our, of our, of our you know, we, our parents remind us about their parents. So it's very similar. So we're just talking about finances and I'm sort of running a few accounting questions past him. Like something doesn't sound right here. So I got on the phone with him, with his accountant. I'm asking a few questions. I'm like, you need to get rid of this accountant. Mm. Um, and now he's, so basically the way it was working was the accounting firm that was doing his tax was treating him like he was a PAYG, so a doctor working in a hospital. But Jake obviously is a sole trader that works across lots of different companies and provides injectable services. So well, he, was now a business. Now, but you're, that now, was you're, issue. now you're a company. So he's basically earning what an extra, well, you're paying a maximum of 30% tax in his company, whereas he was getting like taxed into oblivion mm -hmm. over 50, 50 cents in every dollar yeah. because he was paying PIYG. So just little things like that that come second nature to someone that's been in business their whole life. So I actually gave you a pay rise. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's funny. I mean, you know, these things come up that exactly what you said, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so, you know, I've met lots of doctors who are crazy business savvy. They're in Bitcoin and yeah. they're investing. They've got, uh, you know, um, yeah. investment portfolios and God knows what else, but that's not me. And I don't think that's most doctors. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's not our skill set. Yeah. There's exceptions to all. I'm, I'm generalizing. There are the unicorns that do understand business and there's a few of them out there, 
but for the most part, I think that they're pretty um, clueless when it comes to that side of the coin. There's nothing wrong with that because how would you know? You didn't study it. You haven't had the experience by the time you get out. Well, you yeah. know, I guess, you know, both in the UK and here, you literally earn a salary. You know what you're going to earn every month barring overtime and, and, and your taxes are already taken. And that's what you do in hospital. I don't know how it works for GPs and other specialties, but you don't really think about it. So, yeah, but as soon as you leave hospital medicine, you become a, you know, aesthetic injector or whatever, you really have to be all over it. So thanks, David. It's all right. <laughs> so we're comparing kind of like doctors in general versus um, business in general. But do you think having seen all that's happened in the aesthetic industry, do aesthetic practitioners, and I'm including nurses, doctors, anyone, um, therapists, um, whatnot, do you think there's a difference between the way they brand versus the general health professional population? So do you mean, do aesthetic doctors brand themselves better? Correct. Well, mm, I don't know about better, but they certainly do it. As opposed um, to what was the other, I was fixing so my hospital doctors and, and well, more traditional specialties. Well, when you're working in a hospital, there's people coming in every day. You don't have to do anything. People get sick, right? People don't come to a cosmetic doctor because they have to. They come because they want to. So all of a sudden you're in an industry where it's want-based rather than need-based. Mm -hmm. So people have choice. Yeah, you're generally not advertising as a yeah. statistic. You, you yeah. have skills. When you're having a heart attack, you're not like, you know, you're not doing a Google search and saying, you know, does this person's Instagram profile look great? What's their work look like? But you're not doing any of those things. So it's completely different. Yeah. And, you know, and oppositely, I think uh, if you're not doing that as, as an aesthetic doctor or someone else, I think it's going to be hard to grow or, or to sustain, you know, um, you know that, that sort of patient flow because, you know, do you need to get your name out there and, and it's a saturated um, market and there are a lot of people doing similar things so if you're not showing your point of difference or more importantly your personality that's why people resonate and come to you really um then yeah i think you're missing a trick mm. especially with um i guess the next generation of cosmetic providers whether they be nurses or doctors they've grown up with like instagram and TikTok and all this stuff so it's like riding a bike for them it's second nature but for people like in the you know the older generation so generation x and you know baby boomers and so on social media generally that wasn't around when they were at school so it's like learning you've got to be it's more difficult i think that the younger generation are probably advantaged in that respect yeah no i agree yes because i belong to the older generation as well. <laughs> so with regards to um the non-aesthetic space uh do you think people need to do any personal branding like anesthetists or or gps do you think they should be doing personal branding just as a general thing i can't stand an ethos advertising it puts me to sleep <laughs> you like that? i just thought of that that's good wasn't it oh god hold on where's the hold on was there your sound effect no good sound effects <laughs> Um, I love these sound effects. Uh, I've got to say, I, I think it depends on the specialty. So I've got some um, breast surgeon doctors um, who are colleagues and they're in the UK and one has actually started a podcast. Mm. And uh, I think it's great because she's sort of delivering education. She's showing her authenticity. Uh, you know, sometimes she's in the OR, sometimes she's in her clinic. But from that perspective, I think it just sort of shines a light on, on, on a doctor in a different way. But you know, if you're a hematologist, um, sort of, you yeah, know, messing around with sort of you know things on the wall. I, I just don't know how you do that in an, in an ethical way, and I don't know. It just depends on the specialty. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, you could look at like a reconstructive surgeon that's doing you know face transplants and people that are born with deformities, or you know they have an accident in the workshop, and or you know what Doctor Pimple Popper. <laughs> mm. I mean, so I think it depends if you've got like a specialty that's quite visual, as opposed to say functional. Um, or obviously it's both, but I mean, you know, it's very hard to like do it before and after for someone that's had you know, open heart surgery, whereas it's a lot more visually impactful to show like a before and after of like putting someone's face back together that's been attacked by an alligator or something, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it's interesting for me because MSAC actually has, um, it's a nonprofit organization. So eventually we'll have a charity arm, which we're working towards. So if a few more of our members are actually higher profile, say with personal branding, um, regardless of their specialty, it might be actually easier to, to have fundraisers happening in the future just for um, pro bono work and that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. So what do you think is the point of differentiation for podcasting within the medical field? compared to other consumable content. We kind of touched on it saying, you can't really fake an hour long conversation. 
but with regards to the content, like um, altering or influencing the therapeutic relationship, we do have to be quite careful speaking to consumers. Mm. So how do you make sure that your podcast is reaching the correct audience without getting yourself in hot water, that kind of thing? I don't think we've ever handcuffed ourselves and, and avoided a topic or you know avoided any controversy and you know and to some extent not that we would do it deliberately but we try and ask some challenging questions or, or questions that people would actually really want yeah. to ask but they're too shy to ask um so from that perspective yeah a bit of um intrigue you know if everything's too safe it's like a, an interview on tv where it's, it's just boring where they where they're just sort of almost having just a polite conversation i don't think that really resonates with anyone people want to know yeah. um you know quite challenging questions sometimes <clears throat> and i think um people have got pretty good bullshit radars these days as well i think so sorry we're allowed to say swear words on your podcast okay um i think people have got they can tell when something's real or not and i think that um when you're asking these questions i think that i mean even some of the brands that we've worked with we've said we're going to ask the questions that we want to ask we want to know about the complications the side effects all the things that can go wrong it's not just about hey this is this is a great procedure and you're going to look fantastic and you know it's amazing and nothing's going to go wrong i mean you've just got to present like the 360 view of whatever it is that you're talking about yeah. like i don't believe any five-star google reviews i just don't because it's not it's not possible because everyone we live in a complaints driven society and you can never get it right all the time so if you see that it's like mm, it doesn't look real it doesn't look authentic i think it's authenticity that what people are, are sort of looking to connect with but we've got 71 five-star reviews on apple Podcasts. well that, they're all my mum <laughs> <laughs> God, your mum's been busy. Yeah, she has. I text her every day. Fair more, enough. More reviews, mum. Yeah, but actually, you know, the more interesting guests that we've we've had on, and and that's been a snowball effect. We've been able to attract yeah. bigger guests, you know, by by having a product. I think people really, you know, want to hear from certain people. You know, um, you know, Paul Nassif or, yeah. or Julie Horn, or you know, hundred people we've had on Dr. Dale. Yeah, because they don't have access to these people. Yeah, we had you on Dana as well um so you know you and i think actually your feedback was it felt like a nice chat amongst friends yeah. so it shouldn't feel like an interview where we're kind of grilling people or in this case you grilling us it's just a chat and 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 our listeners have reported back and said wow i just felt like i was sitting in the room with you sort of yeah. just joining in the conversation almost so well, it should be chat style rather than interview style i think that helps as well yeah well it, it was quite bizarre even at the recent conference that we were at people were coming up to us and saying oh listen to you guys and they're having conversations with us like like they knew us and it was like it was quite an unusual sort of i mean it was obviously flattering you love people it's really nice to hear people love what you do and they resonate and all that sort of stuff but it was kind of like they'd obviously formed a connection with us but we didn't know them but it was it was quite surreal wasn't it jay that's was nice it was yeah. you know and and to meet people and, yeah. and to hear that you know rather than just sort of thinking it's going well to actually hear it and, and have people feedback personally is really nice. That's good. And you mentioned something about wanting alternate health topics like uh, <clears throat> even the uh, CBD yeah. and things like that. So would you be interested in featuring other things like Chinese medicine? Sure, we're looking for, well, yeah. you're trying to help me. I was trying to, yeah. he's just a bit. What's going on, Dan? I will get on it, I will yeah. get on it. So how about ethnic diets and superfoods and yeah. health management? Sure. I think we. I, I don't think there'll be a topic that is off off yeah. uh, off the table. It's just you know we are mindful of we still haven't struck an exact balance, and and, and <clears throat> our injectable episodes by far are probably the most popular. But uh, you know if, if we only do that, then it becomes same same. If we don't do enough, people aren't happy. So we're, we're trying to strike a balance, and what we'd aim towards is you know maybe three out of five would be injectable rotated, one would be business, and one would be out there yeah um wellness or, or otherwise but yeah. um you know that's something that we'll aim towards we'll probably never get it right because of you know our time management and and when people are available but we aim yeah we aim to keep it diverse and you know like if we're interested in a topic then then we assume that our listeners are probably listen a, a large number of them are probably gonna be interested as well it's actually been funny you know starting off with jake and coming from a western doctor background where you know, where's the clinical research? Where's the paper? I don't see it. I don't believe it. This is nonsense. This is all snake oil or whatever. And then slowly, you know, over the course of the last two years, you've worn me down. Oh, I've worn him down. Like he's, you know, quite open now to these sorts of discussions. I mean, I think if we in the first 10 episodes, I would have said, hey, let's do one on um, medical marijuana. You would have been like, are you crazy? Yeah. Um, 
I still don't know, you know, for example, we, we're we aiming to do one on some wellness topics. So for example, uh, maybe physio, pilates, chiropractors, um, osteopathy and naturopathy. Chinese Those medicine. Are, and Chinese medicine, sorry. But, you know, so, so allied health, um, sort of, I guess, alternative medicine, if you want to put it that way. And, you know, I might have some views on one or two of those things, not necessarily factual, but I've just sort of got my own biases, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and so I want to kind of explore my own bias with the podcast at the same time. So, yeah, I've, I've, I think I've, I've yeah. changed my mindset a little bit. Yeah, it's good because we basically agree on nothing. So it's it's actually it's actually really, really good. <laughs> when we're... pretty harmonious so far. Oh, yeah. look, uh, when was it? Was it Saturday? We had a bit of, a, had a bit of um, started off as a text conversation that went a bit <laughs> south, and then David has taught me a lesson: don't discuss sort of important things through a text. Always call. So we spoke, yeah, and, and we talked it through, and, and and we kind of sorted it out. But you know, joking aside, I think having arguments occasionally, a bit like you know, being in a relationship, it'd be weird if everything was just perfect all the time, especially when you're running. A business that you know is now making a small income and and you're sort of talking to thousands of people every week sometimes things have to be sort of you know debated vigorously yeah well it's you've got to have a bit of spice in the relationship Dana. yes i can see <laughs> <laughs> so what other tips and pearls do you have for our audience when it comes to content creation just for the uninitiated health professional in terms of so if you're a health professional looking to create content you yeah mean, talk about what you know and what you believe in and what you're passionate about it's how it, you can't fake authenticity you know if you're um a cosmetic doctor that's passionate about what you do people will feel that yeah you know I, I think that when people try to be what other people expect them to be or chase a topic or chase money even and i think that's a you know i'm sort of changing your question now i'm answering the question i want to answer um I think that, you know, and that's one of the things with business, people chase money rather than chasing the success. And I think that if you love what you do, you it's authentic, um, you're passionate about it, everything else will flow from that. Yeah. Um, going back to, I guess, your question about doctors being on social media. I mean, lots of people deliberately don't or they don't like the idea of it or they think it's silly because they are a doctor and you know, they should be professional. But you know, it can, it can be done in a tasteful way where you're actually educating. And, and like David said, you're, you're showing your authentic, sorry, your authentic self. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's free advertising. You're talking to literally billions of people through several channels, be it Instagram is probably the main one here in Australia, but, you know, there's several others. And um, it's sort of be crazy not to give it a try. Yeah. Oh. Well well, always, my, me and my, my partner will always be looking at Jake's Instagram and laughing. You, you, you got to, you come up with a, a cracker every now and again. Every now and again, once a year, if I'm lucky. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. It's yeah. Good. I, I, you know, I, I, it certainly helped me. I mean, the aesthetic um, industry is different. It, you know, people aren't sick. So I think you can be a bit more playful with it. Mm. Um, but also, you know, I'm not that scared of being a little bit controversial or, or digging a, yeah, digging, digging a finger into someone's side occasionally just because it stimulates conversation. It's not because I'm trying to just be a, you know. Well, I think when people feel indifferent about you, that's probably worse than them disliking you. So I think indifference and not caring is probably, if you can sort of get a reaction out of people to a, to a certain extent, you don't want to be too negative whether, you know, put a hit out on you or anything. But I mean, in terms of just, um, you know, sparking. It's like when you walk past a piece of art. If you walk past a piece of art and you go, eh, whatever, you walk past it. But if you walk past, you go, God, I really hate that. Or I really love it. It's probably better than just indifference. Yeah, totally agree. Be yourself. Well, I guess I'm guilty. I, I asked this question because as a health professional, I'm also guilty of not doing enough personal branding. All I post on Instagram is my food <clears> and the restaurants I go to. And like, it's like, all I do is eat. I don't even work, I just eat. <laughs> but that's obviously not true. I actually have to work to make a living. Um, but anyway, let's wrap up now. Thank you so much for letting me delve into the back end of Inside Aesthetics. And MSEC certainly hopes to have a chance to collaborate with you guys again. Awesome. And um, just as a spiel at the at the end, to learn more about MSEC, our website is www.amsc.org.au. And membership for eligible health professionals is free until the 30th of June with um, full access to our CPD program. So That's thank awesome. you once again. May I plug the uh, podcast so people yeah. know Absolutely. how to listen? Absolutely. So if you if you are on Instagram, uh, go to Inside Aesthetics Podcast. 
Um, if you are on any of the podcast apps already, just search for Inside Aesthetics. Um, the main ones, are Apple Podcasts, Spotify, it's all free. Um, and enjoy. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you.